Hello and welcome to Programming Like It's 1979 Gaming Edition. While working on the NAN to Tetris Let's Build a CPU class, I mentioned a game called Silicon Zeros, which was a programming game that lets you put together a CPU of sorts and solve puzzles. So I figured we will try this game ourselves and walk through some of it. There's a little introduction giving you the scenario. One thing I like about this game is that even though it takes place in the 1960s, they do go out of their way to kind of recognize the sort of structural sexism that affected uh, people of color and women. Let's jump in. So you can see we have a blackboard here with a bunch of puzzles on them. The first few puzzles are just going to be about UI. So here the game wants me to create an adder and rather the adder is already created and wants me to make it output two. I have a number, one. Right now we can't configure any of these components, but we could wire them up. The adder created two, so the puzzle is over. If you go back to puzzle, if you wanna try and be more efficient, you can do that. You can go back to the blackboard or you could just go on to the next puzzle. Let's go back to the blackboard, get that very satisfying cross out animation. We want to connect wires to these adders in sequence so they output three. We can do that. If we do control drag, we can adjust where that goes. If we do just a drag like that, it disconnects it. And then the other thing you can do is you can literally, well, looks like I can't. Let's try it again you touch like that, it will connect, which is nice. Super easy. All right, let's continue. Now they're teaching us about placing modules. We'll go ahead and do that. It'll be super easy. Two plus two is four. We're introduced to Carol. One of the things I like about this game, and now we can configure modules. So here we can see this number is set to zero. If we right click on it, we can make it say what we want. In this case, we want two plus two is four. Great. And now they're just driving home the lesson. So we're gonna place some modules. Figure them, we want to output five, one plus four is five. Fabulous. Now we're learning about readers. So over here you can see we have our memory. We have memory slots, those are locations given by numbers, and we have the contents of those memories. The tooltips in this game are really nice. You could hover almost over almost anything and it will tell you exactly what's going on. So we want to output, we want to have this reader output six. A reader is going to take a memory slot as its input and output whatever's in that memory. We see over here that memory slot 10 contains the value six. So we're going to drop a number here. We'll configure it so it says 10. And then we'll wire it up. And that was it. All of these puzzles on the first blackboard are basically tutorial puzzles. Without configuring models, without configuring modules, place and connect modules so an adder outputs seven. Okay, well, we'll need an adder. You can see we have the values five and two here. So we're gonna need a couple of reader modules. Mm, without configuring, okay. That's interesting. So we're going to need another adder here. Three plus three is six. We have memory slot six. That contains five. Five plus three is eight. We have memory slot eight over there. I need another reader and another adder, I think. Got a very messy breadboard here, that's okay. 
Now we have five and two. All right, now we have a simulator. Um, the last section, the last lesson in our NAND to Tetris course was about sequential memory, which of course involves time. So here we're gonna see how they simulate time. We have over here a latch, which is essentially similar to a D the DFF we used, and it's gonna hold a value for one time unit. If we go over here to test, we can make time go forward. So you can see we've got a couple of adders here. This adder is outputting the number three. That three is going into the latch, but it's not stored in the latch yet. If we go forward, now it's stored in the latch. And we just want to run the sim forward until that latch stores 15. And that's going to be a central mechanic in this game that we're going to return to again and again. Build a machine that stores 15 in a latch and test it in a simulator. Well, we could just build the same machine we saw. But presumably they want us to do something different. So let's do something simpler. We could literally configure a number to 15, put it in the latch, and run forward two ticks, one tick. You could see here we start getting evaluated, where it will start telling us what's the best possible we could have done in terms of the number of modules and what the goal was. I'm now I'm gonna, I'm gonna try hard. I know I always get distracted and I always try and optimize. I'm gonna try to not optimize in this. I'm just gonna try and blast through as many of these puzzles as I can before I get bored. And before you get bored, hopefully. All right, so now we're learning about writers. We want to set memory slot three to the value one. So over here, we now have more UI on our memory. If we click here, that's our goal. That's our goal, and the green tab here is what is currently in the memory, which is nothing. So we'll grab a writer module. This takes two arguments, a memory slot, and what we want to write. So we want to write, write the value one, and we want to write it into memory slot three, I believe. Great. There's a plot. I'm not going to read all the plot partially because I don't want to, you know, spoil the game for you. Uh, it's a cute plot. I kind of like it. All right. So now we had to go back to the board, even though we had solved a bunch of things, because we now have a choice about what puzzle we can do next. The stars are indicate the complexity or the difficulty of it. So let's do stall first. Let's just kind of go left to right. And I'll tell you, this cow's one, <laughs> I, I've, I've looked at it 30 times and I've actually even looked at solutions for it. And even after looking at the solutions, it doesn't fit in my brain. I'll be skipping that one. All right, let's look at stall. How few parts could you take to build something that sets memory slots zero and one, both to one? Okay, so we've got a latch and we've got a number. So one thing they definitely do is give you hints. There, there are a lot of different modules and especially in the earlier puzzles, they, they won't give you modules that you don't need. So you can kind of use that as a clue. I think if we have a second latch here, and we say use the that latch for the memory slot and that slot, that latch, the first latch for the value to write, what will happen is this one will go into this latch, the zero from here will go into this latch, that zero goes there, that one's gonna go there. I think that'll work. I don't know if that's the minimum. Let's find out. Interestingly, I did not do the most efficient. 
can see I've got my various friends there. Oh, I really should. I really should skip this. I don't know. I know I've done this better before. Could I do this with one latch? Oh, yes, I certainly can. All right, we can get rid of this latch and do exactly what we just did. Only that. Since we have a constant one and one, the one value we're writing is constant, that should work fine. All right, that's the last time I'm gonna try and optimize it. I swear before the altar. All right. Let's look at this rewrite. Without configuring modules, get memory slot one all the way up to eight. Hopefully we have an adder. We do not. Without configuring modules. Well, we could. Memory slot one is always gonna be the same. So that's fine. It's starting at zero. So we could read memory slot one. It's an adder, put that there, and then we could write it back to memory slot one. I think that'll work. And you can see the value in memory is going. The game does provide an autoplay function as we move along. We're now introduced to another engineer, Alicia. You know, there's not a lot of places I get respect. They say programming, that's unskilled women's work. I need to do a history video about the history of programming because the, the very term computer used to refer to a person who was doing computations and very often they were women. And the varying amounts of respect that programmers got, you know, as soon as it became a man's job, uh, in the late 1960s, suddenly the amount of respect programmers got rose, which is kind of shameful if you think about it. Let's go back here. Let's do spares first. We have a new part ready, a subtractor module. So we only have the subtractor now. We don't have a matter. Can we build a machine that doubles the value in memory slot zero? Well, we're gonna have to read that value, right? No matter what. Let's see. Uh, we need a zero, right? How do we find a zero? Well, the latch through pure luck will emit a zero at first. So we can do that. Zero minus 43 is minus 43. 43 minus zero is 43. So we want to end up with positive 86. we get negative 86 and then another subtractor this feels like it can't possibly be the most efficient one can it and then a writer 
right, I'm not going to, I'm not going to try and be super efficient. I did not make the goal. I am going back. All right, next, counter. This is going to be a device we're going to use again and again and again, and it's called a counter. So what we need to do is set each memory slot to its own value. And we're starting with a writer. Well, we're going to need a latch, if nothing else. And we're going to need an adder. And we're going to be incrementing by one. So we're going to need that. I think what we do, that right here, that's the cornerstone of our counter. And in fact, it's so important that we're going to copy it later and put it on a palette that doesn't exist here yet. But once we've got that latch holding the value, we can do that. Just wire it up to our writer, and that should be the basis of our counter. And now we could have the simulation run itself. And this looks correct. Validation. This just shows you how tests work. Write a machine that beats the first two tests, but not the third. So the third is putting the number three into one, slot one. One and two are putting the numbers one or two into slot number one. What happened there? I made it go away. Clearly we need a writer because we have to write, and our goal is two, that looks right. Test two, two is in memory and our goal is four, that looks right. Test three, three is in memory and our value is 12, that should fail, so let's try it. So here it's saying that test three is failed. We wanted to build a machine that failed, so that's good. Okay, well, I just had to actually run the test manually to make it happen. Fabulous. We want to build a device that goes through memory starting in slot number zero and sets each slot to its original value plus one. Well, right off the bat, we know we're going to need a counter, which is an adder plus a latch plus the number one. And everything kind of wired up like that. We're then going to have to read the value coming out of memory. Add one to it. And then write it back to memory. Memory slot. I think that's it. Let's try it. Here we can see our program running. And it looks like it's adding one each time. Great! Right, we've got this cows problem that I'm totally going to skip because it's optional. I'm going to go on to board number two. All right, so now we start getting some more UI. We're going to get a palette, which will let us save things. So we're gonna go ahead and rebuild our CPU like we did before. Oh, we can only have the one latch here. We need our adder. I see, so they've added the palette to the CPU. They want us to go back to the first level and grab our counter from there. We can rename this, we'll call it PC for program counter, switch back over here, Dun -da -da -da. wire everything up and we are done.
Okay. Now we're introduced to Jack, who is the villain of this set of levels for Silicon Zeros. All right, so we have a few things we can do here. This, this is kind of an optional path. Let's go ahead and do it. We want a machine that starts at slot number zero, sets even memory slots to one and odds to zero. Well, anytime we hear we're gonna go through memory, we know we need our program counter. We can just wire that up. Even to one and odds to zero. Well, to alternate, it sounds like we're gonna have to We're going to have to have some sort of delay loop. I think we're going to need a couple of, at least one latch, right? The tricky thing here is if even, if even numbers were zero, then that would be kind of easier because we've got our latch emitting zero to begin with. So we're going to have to probably use this one coming out of the program counter. Do we have a subtractor? We do. Okay. okay, what if... What if we use a subtractor after the latch? We know it wants to be either one or zero. So if we can make this subtract either one or zero, got a one there. If we feed that back into the latch, the next value will be one. One minus one will be zero, which will feed back in. We'll have a little loop here, alternating one and zero. I think that'll do it. Look at that, it actually worked. Fabulous. So this one is conceptually similar, but now instead of, I need to see the goal to understand this. One, zero, zero, one, zero, zero, one, zero, zero. So it's conceptually similar. Similar. We're clearly going to need some sort of delay loop here. I'm gonna need a program counter. the same, only no, because if we do this, well here we can do it. What this should end up doing is it'll be correct for the first pattern, it'll be one zero zero, but then I think it will be one one after that. Now that's alternating two things. Right, okay, so I think to do this, I need a little more space here. We want this to be subtracting one anytime there's any ones in here. So we want to essentially do this. I think that'll work. Yes. I think I, I, I'm going to be full transparency here. I've solved this one before, so I, I struggled with this a lot the first time I encountered it. So next we're going to go to this DREF. Can you replace each slot that contains the location of another slot with the value held in that other slot? So this is indirect memory access, essentially. Well, we'll grab our program counter, since we know we'll need that. We're going to be reading that first value. Memory slot zero. 
So memory slot zero contains 10, which is a memory value. Memory slot 10 contains 30, so we want to read that. And then we want to write it. Like so. Can it be that simple? I don't know. Let's try it. So one thing you see here is that the reader is producing a dash or a no value when there's no valid value and all of the components, all of the modules behave specially in the face of that value. So a lot of these puzzles rely on that behavior. Replace all ones in memory with zeros. Okay, well, let's grab our program counter. And read it. Oh, now we get an input selector. Fabulous. So this is essentially a multiplexer. It multiplexes on whatever value you wire up to here. So we're going to wire it up there. And we want to replace ones with zeros. So I'm going to configure this to be zero. And you can see that this input is highlighted. So if this were a zero, it would grab from this input. But it's a one, so it's going to grab from that input. That gives us zero as our output. We're going to be using these multiplexers a lot. Just the number of inputs they have. Right now we just want two. Looks like that worked. Store 0451 in memory slots 0 through 3. So here we're going to have a multiplexer. It's going to be outputting right to there. We want four inputs. The selection is going to come from our program counter. And then we're just going to 0, 4, 5, 1. And then we can avoid using an extra number by just grabbing the zero from there for efficiency. And I didn't actually wire it up, my bad. There we go. Try it now. And that's multiplex. Multiply looks super complex and I've never done it. I don't even have the achievement for it. So let's continue on. This looks the same as our replace all ones with zeros, but instead it's replace all zeros in ones. All zeros with ones. Now we have a different type of device. It's basically a demultiplexer. It's going to take a value and then route it to one of these. Obviously we want to use this probably only need two outputs. We're going to need a reader to read the value in memory. We've got one here. In fact, we can configure this to only have one output, right? No, that's not right. Because actually, I think that is right. Because when this output select is non-zero, this should be dash, which will do nothing if we write to it. So we're going to do that, and then that. Let's see if that works. Looks like it worked.
fast count. So this is a cute little puzzle where they want us to write three memory locations in one clock cycle. And that's the sort of thing we can do if we don't care at all about being efficient. So we will just put down three writers. So one into one, two into two, three into three. All right, you can do that. Configure this to be two, two into two, and configure this to be three. Three into three. One clock cycle, done. Uses a lot of parts though. Replace all zeros in memory with ones and all ones with zeros. Well, they're giving us a hint here by only giving us the output selector, the multiplexer. I'm sure we'll need a program counter. So let's see. We're going to need a reader because we only want to do this when there is a memory value. That's going to be hooked up to our output selector. Is it? Is it though? Right, and this is why they showed us, why they had that little fast count exercise. Because in fact, what we can do here, I don't need, don't need this. Right, and so now we're gonna have our latch essentially giving us, the input is going to be what memory location are we going to write? We're going to have two writers, which is why they gave us that fast count trivial exercise. And then for our output, we know that if it comes out of output number one, which is this one, we're going to write a zero. So we'll actually just put a zero here. Otherwise, we'll write that one. It's a little complicated. So interesting that this one is so much more complicated than the only write a zero or a one is. Now we're starting to get to the fun part. So we've got instructions. Decode and execute the zero mem instruction. We have a new part here called the instruction decoder. So what's going to happen is we're going to read a value from memory. And you see here, we're actually getting a full instruction out of memory. The instruction decoder will break this instruction apart into opcode, source, target, destination. I get a little frustrated here because what this source, target, and destination mean varies. Um, for each instruction. In the zero mem case, we're going to hover over here. It's going to set memory slot 89 to the value zero. So we need a writer, obviously. Memory slot 89, and we need a number, which is going to be zero. So this is obviously a very simple instruction. And that's our machine. Now we're gonna get a different instruction, a different opcode, memory set. Set memory slot 89, so once again, the destination field is set to what we're writing, to this source value, 6, 32, 12. Let's go ahead and, we don't even need to read here. Oh, yes we do, because we need to get the instruction and decode the instruction. It's all gonna be memory set. There's no, dis there's no decisions we have to make here. We'll need a writer. Once again, that and that. So very similar to the last one we made, except we're actually getting the value out of the opcode here, or out of the instruction. Little bit of plot here, we're not gonna bother reading, you can experience it for yourself. 
dragging. This one is silly. They just show you the thing I've been doing for the entire game, which is configuring, uh, connecting things by touching them rather than by dragging out a wire. So now we get memory, we get registers, which are like latches, but they have multiple cells, multiple memory cells in them. So we're going to configure this one to have eight values. These are the inputs. These are the values that are actually stored. We have a new CPU instruction here. So let's read it. And decode it. This is going to be something we're going to do a lot. All right, so set register three, the value in dest, to the value in source. So uh, we need we need a mux. No, we need a dmux. Output selector, they call them here. Go ahead and do that. Those are actually, you could do that so you can see the lines, or to save space, you can just shimmy them right over there. Output select value, and that should set the values in the register. As we run, you can see the values populate into the register. Great. Here we go, basic CPU, a little more complex. They say it's hard. I think. I think we can do this. Execute all instructions. So let's look at our tests. See, there's a bunch of different tests here. And at least in the ones we're spot checking, there are only these two types of instructions. Set register and save. Well, I'm going to be super lazy. Since I know I just implemented set register back here, I'm literally going to copy and paste it. Let's see if, uh, if that gets us part of the way here. Some, some more space. So the odd man out is the save register. Set the memory slot specified by register three, this is in the target field, to the value from register six. So we're going to use two things here. I'll go ahead and put my program counter off screen. One thing we need is we're going to need a writer because we're saying set the memory slot. And we know that the value is going to come from this target field. You see how it's a dash here in the case where we have a set register opcode. That dash means we can just always have this thing writing. Where is it writing to? It's going to be writing from the, the memory slot specified by register three to the value from register six. So this is already wrong. All right. So this memory slot is going to be whatever was in the appropriate register, but we don't know what how are we going to wire all these up? We're going to need a mux. So that's going to live on the opposite side of our registers. Nope. Dmux, I mean. Input selector. Okay. Line those up. This is memory slots specified by register 3 to the value from register 6. So both of our values are going to come from these registers. So what I'm doing here is not good enough. I'm actually going to have to do... Can I copy paste this? Let's try it. Oh good, I can. can zoom out, then it's harder to read. I'll just... Uh, This is where that dragging really comes in handy. Okay. So now we have two of these demuxes. And we can use them for two different things. 
So we have input selects for both of them, right? So one of those input selects is going to be going to the source from here, from our opcode, and the other is going to be going to the target. Um, since it says set the memory slot to the value, I will connect the target up to that one and the source up to that one because that specifies the memory slot, that specifies the value we're writing. Ooh, that's a little bit complicated. Have I got it? Is that everything? Let's run it and see. I see values going into memory. Don't know if they're the right values. Great, we even managed to do it at the uh, minimum number of modules. Apparently a real CPU needs to be able to do work on values from memory. So they're giving us another control module, an operation selector. It's like an input selector, but it takes instructions from opcodes instead of indexes. Okay, if you say so. Do we need... I don't think that's right. I think we actually still need an instruction decoder. Right, so it's not quite visible here, but each of these opcodes, M set, add M, etc., implicitly has some number associated with it. You can see here, M set is three and add M is five. So since M set is wired up here at the moment, you can see the M set input is highlighted as is the output. So that means that the output will be equal to whatever this is. So M set set memory slot 70 to the value five. Writer for that. Memory slot. So we could do this, right? But that's not what they want us to do. So the question is which of these is overloaded? And it looks to me here so memory set uses the destination to fill this slot here. And Adam also uses that destination. So we don't need this op selector for our destination argument. We can just wire that one directly up. But for the other arguments, mset just grabs the art ar grabs the argument out of source. Adam actually adds the result here. So, M set's going to go there, that's going to go there, and then we're going to drop an adder. That adder is going to add source and target, and the sum is going to go there. I think that is all we need to do here. Apparently not. What did I get wrong? Set memory slot. Aha, I see what I did. Set memory slot 75 to the sum of slots 91 and 93. So, we didn't actually want to get source and target. We need a couple of readers here. It's getting crowded in here. Actually, that is fine, because as long as they've designed the puzzle so that we always get a dash out of there for the invalid opcodes, it should work out.
Great. And then the last thing we're gonna do in level two is this arithmetic CPU. All we need to do, famous last words, is build this final CPU executing all instructions. So we have our set R, we have our save, and we have a new instruction, adder. Are there any other instructions? I don't see any others. Well, I'm gonna optimistically run back to our basic CPU and copy all of that. In fact, let's put it on the pellet. Oof, it takes up a lot of space. Anyway, this isn't gonna fit. I think I have the screen sized a certain way for the convenience of having a YouTube video that you can actually look at. And that means it's gonna involve me moving around a lot, I apologize. If you're playing full screen on your PC, I think you would actually have enough room for this. All right, so this CPU should handle the set R and save directives properly. We have this new one, add register, set register three. To the sum of registers seven and two. Oof. All right, so what do we need? Well, we know I think we know that the outputs here from these input selectors will in fact always be the contents of registers seven and two. Maybe. Because for our save functionality, we have them wired up the same. I guess the question I have is, can we do this without the op selector at all? Well, let's try it. So we know we're going to need an adder because we need the values. The sum of registers 7 and 2, which is going to be that, 7, 2, whatever, the two different registers. Can I find one where adder is the first? Well, let's step through. Let's just make sure this is correct. So I'm gonna do the set register. Here they are. So here we are in the adder. Here's our output. Now here's where it gets tricky, right? Because what do we wanna do with this output? There are two problems here, two things we're doing wrong. Darn it, it just went away. So first we want to take this output and vector it into register three. And right now you can see that we have wired up this source value there. So that's wrong. So that's one place where we are going to need an op selector. Let's go ahead and put that op selector down right now. Okay. And we know it's gonna wanna hook we're gonna wanna hook it up to there. It's going to be there. So that's the set register case. But then in the adder case, we're gonna want that sum coming from here. Yeah? Yeah. All right, so that, that was one problem that I think we just solved. Zoom out, walk through this again. All right. And here we could see that the correct value, 41, coming out of our addition is in fact gonna be set into register three. So that's good. But then the other thing is over here we can see that the writer is about to 
write something to memory, which the add register command should not be writing something to memory. Let's go back in time. What should it be doing in set register? For set register, it should be doing nothing. So only the save command should be writing things to memory, right? So let's add another op selector. I feel like this is almost certainly not the most efficient way to do this. That's okay. We're gonna grab that, pull it all the way over here. And the only thing we want, the only time we wanna write this value here is when it's the save command, the save opcode. So let's walk through and make sure that that write value is only a dash, except when the command is save. That looks right. Run the simulation. Hey, we did it, and it it was it was optimal. That's fantastic. Smile for the cameras. That is the entire second level of Silicon Zeros.